Number 10, Tempest. Eva Bell first made her appearance in all new X Men issue number one in 2013. She could be viewed as one of the most useful of the new mutants to surface in the past decade. Because her abilities are so based in something that the X Men and mutants and, well, sort of all of Marvel seem to get involved with more often these days time travel. Tempest has chronokinesis powers which allow her to alter the way time moves around her in the area she is in and allow her to create time bubbles which she can send through time for a short while and even time travel fully herself. She has been referred to as near omega level and honestly with a bit more control over her powers I could see her making the omega list any day. Tempest is also one of the house of X's the five and helps to bring deceased mutants back to life by speeding up the growth process within their eggs. It sounds creepy when I say it like that but more will be explained. Number 9, Morph. I really like this mutant because with him they found a way to make shape shifting abilities unique again and somehow make them even weirder and cooler at the same time. Morph, aka Benjamin Deeds, is able to shape shift into those he spends time with, slowly, over time. So the more time he spends with you, the more he starts to resemble you. He really is the embodiment of what it feels like to live in somebody else's shoes. As he fuses with you, he takes on your look, your voice, and also exudes an energy that encourages you to trust him, to feel relaxed and calm in his presence. I just think this is such a cute way to imagine shape shifting and a useful way to use it as well. Potentially calming your target into submission as opposed to causing them harm. It's kind of like the anti-mystique of shapeshifting, I think. Number 8, Gold Balls. Gold Balls recently became a very important mutant in the comics. He is part of a group known simply as The Five on Krakoa. Together he and Proteus, Elixir, Hope Summers, and Eva Bell can help to bring forth new life, or well, sort of old life really. They are able to resurrect any mutants who have been lost by cloning them and with the help of X, restoring their previous memories so that in essence, they kind of are the lost mutant returned. Gold Balls power is similar to Minoru Mineta of My Hero Academia. Instead however, Fabio Medina produces Gold Balls. Hence his name. Originally, these were simply seen as balls of various sizes, which could be launched in a sort of an attack mode. Later, it was discovered that they were actually infertile eggs, and with the help of the five, would become the home of unborn, resurrected mutants who had fallen. Gold Balls made his first appearance in Uncanny X Men Volume Three, Issue Number One. Number seven, forget me not. Propositional existentialism incarnate. To be or not to be? That is the question. With forget me not, you can actually never be quite sure. Although you probably would be more inclined to think that he didn't exist. Not to be in this case. Or scratch that. To not even know who I was talking about when I asked your opinion on if he existed or not. Forget Me Not's mutant powers are that he is imperceptible, meaning that no one even knows he's there or can sense him. This translates to technology. And this also goes beyond just the physical perception as well. Even telepaths struggle to take note of him. There are some weird exceptions to his power though, like Phantom X claiming that he could always detect Forget Me Not for some reason. And Psylocke has been able to find ways to locate him within others' memories through absences and holes that he leaves behind. But even Xavier himself had to set a once an hour reminder in his mind in order to remember Forget Me Not. And he was one of the most skilled at remembering him, so apparently other than Phantom X though, who could just remember him because his senses are real good? I don't believe it. I think Phantom X is fibbing. He's just trying to sound cool. It's like, I always knew he was here. I can see him right now. It's fine. He's overweight. Rude. Number 6, Nature Girl. Nature Girl was given her name by iBoy. The two mutants also went on a bit of an adventure together while babysitting Jubilee's adopted son, Shogo. And the two were both a part of Jubilee's team of mutants to train at Kitty Pride's Xavier Institute for Mutant Education and Outreach in Central Park. They are also really cute together, with iBoy being covered in eyes and Lynn with her little antlers being a master of nature. Lynn Lee, aka Nature Girl's powers consist of an ability to bend nature to her will and communicate with it. She is able to soothe beasts, can control the elements, and can even heal nature. Truly the mutant we could all use right now, am I right? Come on, heal this, heal this terrible earth that we have destroyed. Lynn Lee was also a student at the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. Number 5, Brew. Oh my goodness, I love Brew so much. I love Brew too much. Calm down, Amanda. So Brew has to be one of the cutest mutants on this list, just FYI. Brew is a mutant and a member of the Brood alien race. Brood are typically born with an urge to kill and consume. They do not understand compassion and empathy in the same way that humans do. But Brew was born with compassion, which actually made him a mutant of the race, and also helped him to become independent, separating himself from the hive mind and developing his own sense of self with the ability to make his own decisions. Well, you might not think of compassion as a mutant ability, for the Brood it very much is. In in fact, when young brood are born with such mutations, they are usually deemed as a reject and killed. But due to the dwindling population of the brood, the brood queen allowed brood to live. He studied at Jean Grey's mutant school for higher learning. I mean, guys, wears a cute little suit. It's so cute. Never thought brood could be as cute, but there you go. There you have it. 
Anything is possible if you believe. Number four, Sapna. While Sapna may have only existed in corporal form for only a short time in the comics, it's possible she could actually live on forever in Magic Soul Sword. Sapna was a young mutant girl who appeared to have magical powers at first. This intrigued Magic, who wanted to know the extent of the young mutant's powers, and so took her to see Doctor Strange. It turned out that she actually had language based powers. But because her powers manifested while she was in limbo, this caused her to absorb all of the magical and demonic knowledge of that realm. Meaning that she could control demons and open gateways to other realms and dimensions. Magic was attempting to train her when Sabna had visions of doing harm to magic and that made her run away. The being that offered her help only wanted to use her and Magic was forced to kill Sapna with her soul sword. However, this also preserved Sapna's soul within it, allowing her to live on in spirit, sort of. So she's like dead, but she still she's in her soul sword, so you know. Lives on in a sword. Sounds boring. Number three, Maxime and Manon. Maxime and Manon are kind of like a mutant duo, so I thought I'd include them together. They are twins from the future, whose mutant powers activated before puberty, so they're kids. In the future, they attended the Xavier Institute for Young Mutants. However, they were then kidnapped and brought back to the present, where they were brainwashed by a hob and used as evil little weapons. Scary weapons too, may, may I add. After being defeated, the two children were left in the care of Jean Grey. They had been good children before they were sort of corrupted, and it was believed that they could probably be redeemed. Their powers allowed them together to severely mess with people's heads, telepathically. Maxime's powers allow him to manipulate people's emotions, while Manon can alter someone's memories. They both also possess some mind control abilities as well. A dangerous combination, as we saw in New Mutants Volume 3, Issue Number 4. If you haven't read that yet, go read it because it's, it's messed up. It's great. Number two, hindsight. While Nathaniel Carver might not appear to have the strongest power just yet, I'm certain, like most underrated powers, that with more control over his abilities, he could prove to be more useful than originally anticipated. Nathaniel, aka Hindsight, has the ability to see one's recent past upon making physical contact with them. He can also use this ability on objects, allowing him to see any psychic imprints left behind on that object. A power that Jean Grey actually also has. But one of my favorite things about Nathaniel was his fear of these powers getting in the way of a relationship that he started developing with fellow student Benji, aka Benjamin Deeds, aka Mork, who I mentioned earlier. Fortunately, love overcame fear and the two ended up together, and are admittedly adorable together. Yay! Future gay X-Men, bring them on, I'm ready. Give me all the gay X-Men. Number 1. Moira McTaggart One amazing revelation we got from the House of X Powers of X series was the truth behind Moira McTaggart. Moira has always been painted as an ally to the X-Men, but in House of X we found out what really drew her to their cause. Although Moira has been a long standing character in the comics first appearing in 1975, it wasn't until recently that we discovered she was a mutant. Dun dun dun. It turns out that her power is to live her life again, allowing her to see the different outcomes of different futures and allowing her to effectively alter her own fate as well as the world with her life choices. Her resurrection power is an odd one, and Destiny confessed to Moira that she only saw her living a maximum of 11 lives, if she played her cards right. Still, when used correctly, it would appear to be a powerful mutant ability, as you see in House of X, if, if you read it. If you haven't read it, what are you doing? Get out of here. Go read it. Number 10, Kid Omega. We're living in a very different world now in terms of mutant history. One where no death is considered final, where Marvel has kind of acknowledged the trope of comic book resurrection and given it to mutants as a gift to make them even more powerful. The Five are a mutant group who can bring back any fallen mutant to life. As such, despite Quentin Quire having a recent and very gruesome death in the comics, we see him up and back to joining his teammates in the following issue of X-Force after his death. In case you're wondering how he goes, Quentin has his head blown off in an explosion, and while Wolverine is split in two and seems to still kind of be moving afterwards, Kid Omega doesn't have those kinds of abilities. So he likely needs help from the Five to return. Although we don't see it, but you can assume, one can assume that's what happens. Cause yeah, I don't think he can just be like, my head's gone, I'm fine. Number nine, Lady Mastermind. Lady Mastermind, AKA Reagan Wingard, recently popped back up in the giant size Nightcrawler comics and was welcomed into the mutant nation of Krakoa. Some however may not know or appreciate her mutant history and background. Just who is Lady Mastermind? Well, she's the daughter of Jason Wingard, AKA the original villain known as Mastermind. Her powers take after her father's, allowing her to create realistic illusions projected into her targets 
its mines. While she also has an even lesser known suspected half sister, Reagan's powers are often depicted as being the more powerful between the two, with it even being said that her abilities are even more stronger than her father's. Additionally, she is also fairly skilled in hand to hand combat, a skill set her father actually very much lacked. He was hilarious in a fight. He's like a rag doll. <laughs> uh, sorry, mastermind. Number eight, Sabretooth. Resurrected only to be put down again, Sabretooth had found himself becoming a good guy following the events of Axis. It was a strange direction for him, but also at the same time, kind of great. Wolverine even allowed him to be in charge of the Weapon X team, which was rebranded to Weapon X Force under Sabretooth's leadership. In the end, Victor ended up going to hell and sacrificing himself to save his team and to free his son Graydon, who was trapped in hell. Sabretooth himself was prepared to face an eternity of torment for all the bad that he'd done in his life, but feeling good about his final choice. He lost his mind in the process of this sacrifice, becoming feral once more. Marduk, who is sometimes known as Satan in the world of Marvel, was not interested in tormenting a man who had redeemed himself fully and was also not really aware of what was going on with him, with him being feral and all. Instead, he decided to release Sabretooth on the world again, encouraging him to once again earn his place in hell and returning Sabretooth to his villainous roots. So out into the world he goes, super feral. Just uh, now he's a villain again. That's okay, he's trapped now, but still sad. Number seven, Wolverine. When you've been around as long as Wolverine, you're entitled to a few deaths, and Wolverine has definitely had his fair share of deaths. One such death and subsequent resurrection took place over the course of a few stories, namely the death of Wolverine and the hunt for Wolverine where we'd found out that he'd been resurrected. He died after saving test subjects from having their skeletons infused with adamantium, which of course happened to him. However, in doing so, he was forced to cover himself in the metallic liquid, sacrificing himself as eventually it hardened around him, encasing him and leaving him without any oxygen to breathe, so he suffocated. Eventually, he was buried after Kitty Pride phased him out of his casing, but he would later be resurrected and used as a weapon by Persephone, before managing to heal, truly returning to life, and breaking free of her control. And then of course he became the Wolverine that we that we got again. Yay. Because Wolverine can't die, right? He's too popular. It's never gonna happen. Number six. Cypher. Cypher finds himself resurrected after he was killed by a bullet when Selene brings him back using the transmode virus. Originally, he was also under her control, kind of like what happened to Wolverine, and was used to attack his fellow teammates and his friends. But after his connection to Selene was severed, his own personality returned to him. And I think the best thing personally about Doug Ramsey's resurrection is for him, it was actually used to make him stronger. This is something we see sometimes in the comics when characters come back to us, and for him, I really loved this. Before, Cypher's powers weren't as extraordinary, but once resurrected, he can read all aspects of language. So that's including physical language, making him a skilled fighter, and technology as well. He can actually speak to computers. He is even shown to understand architecture as though it were a language, capable of reading the weak spots in a building simply by looking at it. I couldn't even imagine if architecture was a language. You just look at a building and you're like, I know everything about it now. I talked to that building. Number five, magic. Young Ilyana may have tragically died of the legacy virus, but Velasco still had a piece of her, and that was all he needed to resurrect her. Well, he had a piece of her soul anyways, not like an ear or something, that would be weird. Limbo was currently being ruled by Amanda Sefton, and Velasco planned to bring Ilyana back so that he might use her to overthrow Amanda and regain control of Limbo. He used a bloodstone that contained a potion of magic soul in order to bring her back, but only had enough of her soul to bring her back in her dark child form. Now, this version of Ilyana, unfortunately, lacked a soul of its own, making it eh, pretty useless to Belasco, actually. Eventually, she would join back up with the X-Men, get her soul sword back and control of Limbo back, and through the destruction of a bloodstone, regain her soul. Woohoo! But it would be a bit of a journey. Still, I like her dark child form with her, her horns and such. Pretty good. Number four, Cyclops. Maybe one of the oddest resurrection to date. Time to get timey-wimey. Cyclops died during the death of X event, poisoned by Terrigen Mists. 
Wow, what a way to go. But after he died, he became a symbol and even in death was inspiring in a way leading mutants from beyond the grave. And then he randomly showed up at the end of extermination. It turns out that he was actually resurrected through a plot of cables. Now, Cable had a scientist that Cyclops had saved and he made him make a pill-sized device that could basically channel or redirect the power of the Phoenix Force. Cable then implanted this device inside Cyclops' heart moments after his death. And later in Phoenix Resurrection, when Cyclops is momentarily resurrected by the Phoenix Force in an attempt for it to try and seduce Jean to return to it, the Force becomes channeled through the device in Cyclops' heart, resurrecting him. So yeah, Cable managed to make this resurrection happen through some pretty crazy planning, science, and time travel. Pretty elaborate plan there, bud. Number 3. Jean Grey I mean, how many times has Jean come back? She has to be one of the most resurrected X-Men on the team. However, not all of her resurrections can actually be considered real. Some were kind of explained away as basically being fake, like she was never dead. One of the most lackluster or weirdest ones actually has to be when she was killed by a sentinel and then only remained dead for like one or two issues <laughs> before she returned. We don't really talk about that one a lot, but it happened. And one of the most meaningful had to be when Magneto killed her by shooting an electromagnetic magnetic pulse through her that was so powerful it gave her a massive stroke. Now in the end Wolverine of course snick snicked her to spare her from some of the intense pain that she was feeling. And although we'd have young Jean, older Jean would remain dead for over 10 years in the comics, only recently returning to the Marvelverse in the 2018 miniseries Phoenix Resurrection. The Phoenix brought her back once more but Jean demanded that enough was enough and it had caused enough trouble and now it should leave her alone for good and it acquiesced uh, for the time being. You know how that Phoenix Force is. It's always gonna come back. It's just, it's a love story between those two, Phoenix Force and Jean Grey. Number two, Trinary. Considering the modern age we live in, Trinary is a pretty powerful mutant. Her abilities allow her to control all tech that is within her line of sight. She has used these powers to move massive sums of money digitally and to manipulate and control Sentinel tech. Currently on Krakoa, Trinary is one of the few technopathic mutants trusted with the important project known as Sleeping Giant, wherein mutants monitor for upcoming advancement in Sentinel technology such as Nimrods or the creation of a mother mold, so that they can ideally put a stop to its development. Project Sleeping Giant were instrumental in helping the X-Men to destroy a mother mold that Orcus was creating before it went online. Number 10, I Boy. While Trevor Hawkins may seem like an absurd mutant all covered in eyes and whatnot, I wouldn't write him off just yet. His mutation revealed itself following the events of the Avengers vs X-Men. He has died multiple times since his introduction in the Wolverine and the X-Men series, but he always keeps randomly coming back. As I said, you might think his death has occurred so many times because his abilities could be deemed as lame. What use is being covered in eyeballs? Sounds more inconvenient than anything. But his multiple eyes have actually granted Trevor some pretty cool powers. For one, he's been shown to be able to use his eyes and the multiple perceptions from them in target practice, making him a really proficient marksman. His improved vision also allows him to be better at reading people's nonverbal cues, giving him greater insight into those people that he interacts with. People or mutants. This also translates into battle by giving him enhanced perception when it comes to an incoming attack, being able to tell when someone is about to pull a punch, etc, etc. And of course, his eyes also allow him to see on both a microscopic and a telescopic level, meaning he can see a little speck of dust or see clearly something that is quite far, far away. If you're wondering why I looked over there, I was looking far, far away. That's me trying to have telescopic vision. It's not working. Number 9. Triage Triage made his first appearance in the all new X-Men series. His powers involve life force control over other beings, and for a while some believed his powers also granted Christopher Mew's immortality. However, Christopher appears to have died after being forcibly cured of his mutation, which in itself ended up killing him. With his powers, Triage was able to heal others and could even reanimate corpses, though their state of decay would remain unchanged. And if he had been granted more time, who knows, he may have even been able to completely heal and resurrect people, restoring them to a more mm, lively and maybe less zombie-like appearance. Too bad he died. Although is he dead? Is he not dead? Was he immortal? I don't know. Stay tuned to find out more. Number 8. Hijack David Bond was first introduced in Uncanny X-Men Volume 3. He was revealed to be a technopath with a proficiency for controlling cars with his mind. He could start an engine, unlock and open doors, and make them drive around. 
A pretty sexy power in my opinion. But then again, I have an affinity for cars because I'm a weirdo. After David discovered his powers, he went to parking lots at night to test them out, but ended up being caught by the local police. At the time, his girlfriend Karen was with him. Terrified, she actually outed David as a mutant, getting him into quite a bit of trouble. David was then rescued by the X-Men while trying to flee the police. He later took the codename Hijack. Appropriate, I think. His powers have also been shown to be able to manipulate more tech than just vehicles. He can actually use them to defeat sentinels and even interfere with technological armor. Not a mutant that Iron Man would like to go up against then. Although, Iron Man is a bit of a technopath himself now. Hmm. I wonder who would win in a fight, but I think my money's still on Hijack. His technopath powers seem stronger. Come at me if you think Iron Man would win, but. I don't know. Number seven, Abigail Brand. Abigail Brand was created by John Cassidy and Joss Whedon and made her comic book debut in Astonishing X Men Volume 3. She is a no nonsense badass who is half mutant and half alien. One of the first to show us that even those with alien heritage can also be mutant too. Brand is best known in affiliation with S.W.O.R.D., a division of S.H.I.E.L.D. that seeks to guard the world against and deal with extraterrestrial threats. S.W.O.R.D. stands for Sentient World Observation and Response Department, in case you didn't know. And Brand serves as the commander of the organization, the head of the organization if you will. Her mutant power is contact pyrokinesis. She can produce blue or red flames on her hands and use those to burn through almost anything or anyone that gets in her way. So watch out for Abigail Brand, she'll mess you up. Number 6, Gabrielle Kinney. Gabrielle Kinney has been through a series of code names since her introduction in All New Wolverine in 2016. When Gabby was introduced, she got to play the role of Little Sis to another favorite mutant, X23, Laura Kinney, who had actually adopted the code name Wolverine in that series. She was the all new Wolverine, get it? See, Gabby is also a clone of Wolverines, which makes her part of a weird kind of clone family. Ergo, her powers are also similar to those of Laura and Logan's. She has bone claws and a healing factor and enhanced senses. But she also has a different ability than her predecessors. She cannot feel pain, making her an extremely tough mutant to go up against. Also, probably be hard for her to know when she's like getting close to being defeated. Like, I don't know, I can't feel it. Number five, Matthew Malloy. One of the most powerful mutants who kind of no longer exists, but he could still exist, I guess, if writers decided to bring him back. He was basically written out of existence when Tempest went back in time and prevented his parents from ever meeting, meaning he was never conceived and therefore did not exist in present day. This had to happen because Malloy proved too strong and unstable with his powers being strongly linked to his emotions. He emitted a blast of energy that ended up destroying most of Atlanta. He also has strong reality warping powers, telekinesis, and telepathy. He could also even manipulate matter. It was even suggested that he was beyond Omega level in the comics, so although writers have written him out, I wouldn't be surprised at his power level if he didn't find a way to return to the comics. He didn't even make it to 10 issues in Uncanny X-Men Volume 3. Still, he demonstrated such power that I feel he's really worth mentioning. You know, we might see him again someday. Who knows? Number 4. Trinary. Trinary is another technopath. Her abilities allow her to control various pieces of tech within her line of sight. Similar to Hijack, this also includes, but is not limited to, sentinels. In fact, born and raised in India, after discovering her mutant abilities, she used them to steal money from the top five highest earning CEOs accounts. She then transferred and divided that money up between all the working women of India. Is it weird that I kind of love that? Because I kind of love that. Very Robin Hood. This later led to her imprisonment, which she managed to escape. She also appeared in House of X, working alongside the team of Technopaths and Moira X, who worked on Project Sleeping Giant. Sleeping Giant was created to help monitor for the development of Nimrod tech, which would threaten mutant kinds and eventually humanity's own existence. Technopaths seem to be becoming more common in the mutant world, which I kind of love. It's like as our tech develops and grows, so too do those with powers surrounding it, who seem to be popping up more and more often. Trinary made her comic book debut in the X-Men Red series. Number 3. Sprite not to be confused with the Eternal Sprite, this sprite is also known as Jiu Jing. In fact, she got her codename from Wolverine, who gave it to her in reference to not the Eternal Sprite, but to Kitty Pride, who actually once went by the same codename. Upon having her mutant abilities manifest, Jiu became determined to become the greatest X-Men ever to honor her family and her country, China. Gia's mutant abilities are tied to her appearance. She has wings and resembles a fairy. Her skin is also durable and rock-like, and her body is somewhat morphable. 
Number 2. Shade Darnell Wade became inspired by New York superheroes, and he decided to build his drag persona around this inspiration, taking the drag name Shade. Also, can I just uh, like say that I love that Shade is wearing like a bunch of pouches, <laughs> like as a sash. It's amazing. Shade longed to star in a drag competition show, but her dreams were dashed when her friend Spillin' Tiana Taylor was chosen over her to compete. To add insult to injury, Tiana also spurned Shade on national television, ending their friendship. Shade returned to her apartment with the power had just been turned off, and it felt like she. Had, well, hit rock bottom when her mutant powers manifested. Shade's powers allow her to teleport herself and others to the Dark Force dimension. Since her introduction in Iceman Volume 4, she has taken the alias of Dark Veil. Number 1 Gwenpool Gwenpool has recently been retconned as a mutant. Due to her self awareness of the world around her, she was able to alter her origins. In Gwenpool Strikes Back Volume 5, she uses her reality altering powers to rewrite her own story and make herself a mutant, which Kamala Khan claimed had been the truth all along, and she had just blocked it out as a coping mechanism, making up the world of comics, which in truth was Gwen's real world. This allowed Gwenpool to move through a portal to Krakoa. Once there, she was welcomed by fellow mutants, including her ex, Quentin Quire. She even gave herself a House of X slash Powers of X style character breakdown in one of the final pages of this issue. I guess we'll see if this ends up sticking, but for now at least it seems Gwenpool has joined the mutant ranks. And what a time to be a mutant! If there was ever a time I would want to jump into that world, it would be now. Or the 90s. When of course I could have all the pouches. Give me all the pouches. That's all I want in my costume. Number 10, Prodigy. I feel like a lot of people maybe forgot about Prodigy as he's been MIA for some time in the comics and was depowered during the events of M Day. But with the magic of Krakoa and Dawn of X, he was able to return to us, being resurrected and also regaining his powers. One, Prodigy happens to be a super genius, but this is also because he's a telepath with the ability to basically mimic anyone's skill set and share their knowledge while well nearby. This has also been shown in the past to extend to fighting precognition, where he can basically use his abilities to read a person and predict their next move of attack in a battle, which is pretty sweet. He often also builds his own advanced tech and even when depowered is known to possess a great level of intellect, making him a challenging adversary whether or not he has his mutant abilities. Even as a depowered mutant, you might not want to mess with him. Number 9. Melody Guthrie Continuing from this point, Melody Guthrie aka Arrow has experienced a similar resurrection, though hers was more ceremonial than violent. Well, it was actually kind of both. It was kind of violent and ceremonial. Anyways, Melody is revealed in X-Men Volume 5, Issue 7 to be the first to undergo a rite of passage known as the Crucible. When mutants come to Krakoa in order to earn the right to be resurrected, they must give up their lives and reclaim their power and prove their worthiness, in a sense, in a trial of combat. Melody comes from a proud mutant line, the Guthries. You may be more familiar with one of her siblings, Samuel Guthrie. Three, AKA Cannonball. She fights against Apocalypse for the right to die in combat against him and be resurrected, or really be reborn. The trial is important especially for those like Melody who are depowered mutants. Melody of course lost her powers on M Day and when she is reborn, her powers are restored to her, making her feel whole again. It's kind of a nice resurrection, but also kind of a creepy one because the Crucible is kind of a whole creepy thing. Anyways. Number 8. Gentle. Gentle is a mutant with the abilities of super strength. I know, very hilarious considering his name. He can grant himself immediate muscle mass that basically allows him to change size and increase his strength when needed. It is yet unknown just how strong Gentle can make himself and he is also known for being someone who could potentially even take on the Hulk, although he is more of a pacifist, hence his name. Gentle's real name is Nesno Abidemi. I hope I'm saying that right. Nesno Abidemi. I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong. It's a hard one to say. He was raised in Wakanda, but always felt like an outsider because his father was Russian. When his mutant abilities surfaced, it was actually Aurora Monroe Storm, who was queen at the time in Wakanda, who encouraged him to be sent to the Xavier Institute so he could learn how to better control his powers. His vibranium tattoos are also meant to help him to control those powers. Also, vibranium tattoos are super cool, but I think they're also super painful to get, so maybe maybe don't get them. You can't, because it's not a real substance, but still. Number 7. Egg. Fabio Medina might not seem like a powerful mutant based on his ability, but since his rise to the supremely important mutant group known as the Five on Krakoa, he can be considered one of the most important and powerful mutants around. When he combines his powers with that of the Five, he has control over life and death. Originally, the bouncy gold balls that he shot forth from his chest were believed to be nothing special, but it was later revealed that these balls were actually infertile eggs, which could be used in the process of resurrecting new mutants. Number 6. 
Tempest. Eva Bell is another member of the five. She has actually appeared in less issues than Egg, if you can believe it, despite the fact that she has a pretty neat power set and it's been neat since the beginning, which allows her to time travel. Tempest, as she used to be known, was able to control the passage of time in a specific pocket of space. She could also slow time in a current space that she also inhabited, either slowing time around her or creating time bubbles to manipulate time in that bubble, where she could speed it up or slow it down. The only challenge for her has been losing control of her powers, which can cause them to behave unpredictably. Still, controlling time is a pretty impressive and powerful ability to have. Number 5. Empath Manuel De La Rocha made his first appearance in the original New Mutant series, where he was part of Emma Frost's team known as the Hellions. He's recently reappeared in the newest Hellion series from 2020 and proves just how powerful, but also how sadistic he can be. Empath's power is, you guessed it, empathy. And he can use this power to not only sense others' emotions, but also to control them. In effect, manipulating others into doing whatever he wishes them to do. His influence can be subtle, such that someone might not even realize they're being manipulated by him, or it can be more forceful, turning his victims into complete husks of their former selves and bending them fully to his will. Number 4. Vulcan Vulcan is one of the most powerful mutants around, being an omega level mutant, skilled in energy manipulation and absorption. Yet he is somehow the lesser known of all the Summers, despite his insane power levels. He has also demonstrated the ability to absorb his opponent's powers as well and use them for himself on the rare occasion. Vulcan is the youngest Summers brother, also known as Gabe Summers, and we only learned of his existence in 2006 when he first appeared in the comic X Men Deadly Genesis issue number one. And Yet he is considered the most powerful of these three. Number three, Orphan Maker and Nanny. Orphan Maker still remains a relatively mysterious character, though is also one who still proves to be a force to be reckoned with in combat. Orphan Maker is also known as Peter and was part of a plot of Mr. Sinister's originally. However, when Mr. Sinister decided that Peter could not be controlled, he decided to eliminate him. Nanny, an insane cyborg, however, saved him, believing it was her responsibility to look after orphan mutant children. Children and protect them. Although we'll say she's got a weird way of going about it. While insane, Nanny was also once a scientist and remains quite intelligent. She actually outfitted Orphan Maker with weapons and a powerful suit to help her in her task. While it's still unclear as to what Orphan Maker's true mutant powers are, and while he seems to still have the mind of a child, probably due to Nanny's manipulation, his suit and weapons make him a formidable foe in combat. And he often uses pixie dust in battle to help Nanny influence and control the minds of their opponents. As she herself is a telepath, but a weak one, so she needs a little bit of help. Needs a little bit of pixie dust. Even during a fight with Cyclops, Scott's optic blasts were unable to harm Orphan Maker while he was in his armor. With Scott's blast simply reflecting off the armor, causing more harm than help, really. Number two, Professor Charles Xavier. After Charles died at Cyclops' Phoenix Force infused hands, or optic blasts, we thought that was it for him. He was mourned by many, and it seemed like he'd be gone forever. But then Red Skull got a hold of Xavier's brain and we wished he'd been permanently gone. As with Xavier's brain, Red Skull gained his powerful psionic abilities. Fortunately, the X-Men managed to deal with this problem and burned up Xavier's brain once they got their hands back on it, preventing anyone from using his powers again and completely preventing any kind of resurrection for Charles. Or so we thought. It turned out that Despite his body and his brain being gone, his psychic essence still remained in the astral plane. And when the X-Men went to fight the Shadow King, they actually picked up on this. In the end, he saw a temporary return as X through using Phantom X's body before he gained his own body again and returned more permanently later, wiping the knowledge of his resurrection from everyone except Psylocke, who he tasked with keeping him honest. Good luck, Psylocke. Also, in case you're wondering if you're reading the new Dawn of X stuff, you're wondering why he's young, that's why he's young. Number one, Nightcrawler. Never mind self-sacrificing in death, how about self-sacrificing in resurrection? Yeah, that's what Kurt's gonna do. When Kurt died sacrificing himself to protect Hope, he ended up in what appeared to be heaven in the afterlife. But despite making it to heaven, Kurt found it hard to relax, always remaining concerned for his friends, feeling like uh, there was something more that he actually needed to be doing. When Azazel tried to use him as a gateway to get to heaven, Kurt ended up having a portal created between Jean Grey's school of higher learning and heaven so that the X-Men could join him in the fight and help him to defend heaven. In the end, Kurt used his connection to Azazel to bring himself back to life and to protect heaven by keeping it out of Azazel's reach. Wow. He sacrificed being in heaven just to protect it for everybody else who was there. 
Whew. That is, that's some nice stuff. Number one, Bailey Hoskins. Now you might think I'm joking here if you happen to know the obscure Bailey Hoskins, but I I'm really not. Bailey appeared in his own miniseries titled X-Men, Worst X-Man Ever. He was known for being the worst X-Man ever because his ability only allowed him to do one thing, explode. But he didn't have any regeneration powers, so he basically was a mutant who could never use his powers, otherwise he'd kill himself. It's kind of a one hit wonder. So how is that powerful? Well it's also implied in the series that when he does choose to sacrifice himself and blow up the villain of the story, that he makes it possible for Earth 616 to come into existence. So without him we wouldn't have the main Marvel continuity that we know and love today, potentially. If saving the entire continuity from becoming a dystopian future isn't powerful, then I don't know what is. Number 10, Kid Omega. Kid Omega, aka Quentin Choir, has also been described as an Omega level telepath and telekinetic before. He joined up with the Xavier Institute later in the new X Men series in issue 134. Quickly, Quentin became a prized student of Xavier's, who saw within him a great potential, as brilliant and as talented as he was. However, over time and with the revelation that he had been adopted, he became more rebellious and egotistical. He questioned Professor X and the Professor dream for the world, for humans and mutant kind to coexist in harmony. He began using the mutant drug Kick and created a gang called the Omega Gang, which set out attacking humans. Eventually he was beaten down by the Stepford Cuckoos and he reformed, though he would continue to be known for having a bit of an attitude and a rebellious streak. But hey, isn't that why we love him? Or is that why we hate him? I don't know. You tell me. You be the judge. Quentin Quire, love or hate. Number 9, Prodigy. Prodigy is Dave and Elaine, a mutant who is often associated with the X-Men and who attended the Xavier Institute. He came to the famous mutant school after trying to hide his powers. David has always been a smart kid, but he started noticing one day that he knew things that he simply just couldn't have known and that he didn't remember learning. It turned out that David had been telepathically absorbing knowledge and skill sets from the minds of those around him. Feeling bad about his ability, like it gave him an unfair edge and meant he was kind of cheating, he sought to hide it and doubled down on studying to improve his knowledge naturally. Unfortunately, the mutant hate group Purity ended up uncovering a secret and outing him as a mutant, causing him to turn to the Xavier Institute. He would lose his abilities on M Day, but still remain a valuable hero with all of the knowledge he retained later becoming fully accessible to him again. Being a mutant with studious telepathic abilities, I also love that he was originally depicted as needing glasses. Though, of course, in a land of magic and superpowers, he was later cured of his need for corrective lenses by mutant elixir. Number 8, Elixir. Josh Foley is an Omega level mutant. He found himself at the Xavier Institute after being rejected by his friends and his family because of his mutant status. Sad face. Originally, he was part of the anti mutant group, the Reavers, but discovered during a fight with some mutant students that he actually was a mutant himself with healing abilities, which he used to heal one of the fellow Reavers who was injured in the fight. He tried to hide his powers as long as he could, but eventually he got found out and outed. His powers allow him to manipulate the biological structure of organic matter within a certain proximity to him. He can use these powers to heal or to harm others, and is also able to sense one's life energy and even transfer life energy from one being to another for seal ability. Most recently we saw him in the House of X as a member of the Five, a group of mutants whose powers when joined together allow them to resurrect other fallen mutants. He made his first appearance in New Mutants Volume 2. Number 7, Ellie Camacho. Eleanor is the daughter of Deadpool and Carmelita Karma Camacho. That's right, Deadpool is a daughter. If you can believe it. Carmelita and Deadpool were being held hostage together and fearing that she would die, Carmelita decided she wanted her last acts to be those of love. Her and Deadpool were rescued right in the middle of this act of love, but he still managed to get her pregnant. She initially raised baby Ellie on her own, but did track down Deadpool to at least get him to recognize his daughter and take some responsibility. That was during the time that he was actually working for Butler and constantly having his mind wiped. Butler saw the child as an opportunity and before Deadpool could scare off Carmelita and baby Ellie, took a blood sample from the baby. This happened in Deadpool Volume 3, Issue 34 out of 2013. And in this issue, we learned that the results of that blood test proved that Ellie had an active X gene, meaning she was a mutant who would one day grow up to manifest powers. We don't know what they are yet, but I'm sure they're going to be amazing. Also, she's a mutant, so cool. Number 6, Oya. Despite making her first appearance in Uncanny X-Men, the original X-Men series, Idye still didn't end up joining the group until 2010. Yeah, that original series went on for a long time. Idye made her first appearance in issue 528. Idye's powers involve thermal manipulation. She can convert thermal energy into extreme hot or extreme cold, but she does need thermal energy in order to be able to do this. She can't just like create flames or ice on her own. Idye was discovered by the X-Men through Cerebra. When her powers activated, she accidentally killed her family by burning down her village in Oyo State, Nigeria. The military showed up seeking to stop and destroy her, but Hope and Storm rescued her. Yay! 
Number 5. Rat King A play on the Pied Piper, this mutant villain has the power of Zoopathy, which allows him to control animals using music. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Zoopathy. Zoopathy, it's kind of a weird word. He is the son of the Morlock Piper, whom he shares abilities with. When it was revealed that he was controlling local animals in Central Park into doing his bidding, Nature Girl and Eye Boy joined together to put a stop to him, freeing the animals from his control. Thus ended the reign of Rat King. Although, He's still around, just chilling in his flip flops. Number 4. Genesis Genesis was created by Phantom X using The World, a research facility created by the Weapon Plus program which had been shrunken down to portable size. Think Hank Pym's Lil Quantum Lab, the Ant-Man and the Wasp MCU film. but. Smaller than that. Genesis, aka Evan Sabineur, is the clone of Young Apocalypse. Phantom X created Evan to help overthrow Angel, who had become Apocalypse's horseman of death and sought to replace him. Evan was raised to be basically a good version of Apocalypse, what the X Men villain would be like as a hero, if you will. Evan has already shown that he possesses some of the original Apocalypse's powers and abilities, including super strength and durability, matter manipulation, and energy manipulation. And it is likely that as he grows, he will develop even more of his abilities. Probably. Possibly. We'll see what happens. Number 3. Bailey Hoskins Bailey is a mutant I wish we got to see more of. He is the star of the one-off, non-canon comic series X-Men Worst X-Man Ever. I say non-canon lightly because this is Marvel we're talking about, so everything is kind of canon, just living in an alternate reality. Bailey currently resides in a reality which isn't really quite established, temporarily suggested to be the alternate reality of 656, a placeholder for now. Bailey's mutant ability is self-detonation, which he can regrettably only use once as he has no resurrection or healing powers to protect him. Well, you might think that makes him the worst X-Man ever. I would argue it is the one he chooses to use that power on and stand up against that is actually the worst in that comic series, the vile fascist mutant leader Riches. Number 2. Shark Girl Shark Girl was originally Ayara Dos Santos, a young girl from Brazil who one day noticed an intense craving to eat fish. This was the first sign of her powers manifesting, which eventually resulted in her becoming a mutant wear shark. She ended up enrolling in the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning, but takes weekends off to return to her home in Brazil. Her powers allow her to resemble a shark while maintaining her own mind and memories, and not resemble a shark to the point that, you know, she can't walk. She is more of a, a land shark usually, part humanoid, still able to stand and walk around on her legs and also use her hands. This form also enhances her physiology giving her increased strength and speed and allowing her to breathe both underwater and on land. She was already a great swimmer, but her mutant powers enhance her ability even more. While in her shark form, however, she is also susceptible to going into a blood frenzy, like most sharks are occasionally known to do. So whatever you do, don't bleed around her. She might try to eat you. It's not her fault. Number 1. Amy That's right, her name is just Amy. And we're going to finish it off with a sob story to remind us of all the mutants we have both gained and lost over the years. Though with the five existing in House slash Powers of X, maybe we'll get all those lost mutants back eventually, at some point, unless things change. We'll see. Amy was a mutant who was trapped in the Red Skull's concentration cap on Genosha. She made her first appearance in Magneto Volume 3, Issue Number 9. Amy had illusion based powers that became warped after suffering the horrors of the camp. When Magneto freed her, these powers started wreaking havoc. She ended up creating monsters and nightmares from others' fears and haunted psyches. Amy's powers allow her to create 3D constructs, and when these nightmarish constructs started to kill, it became apparent that either her or those whose nightmares she possessed needed to die in order to put a stop to her malfunctioning powers. Amy, being the angel that she is, decided to sacrifice herself, not finding much reason to live anyways as tortured as she was. Poor Amy. Oh, she didn't even last 10 issues. I just feel really bad for her. No. Coming in at number 10, we have Ultimate Captain America versus Ultimate Giant Man. Now, the Ultimate Universe is well known for being a bit edgier and darker than the regular Marvel Universe. And no two characters better represent this than its versions of Steve Rogers and Hank Pym, with Steve being a much more violent soldier and Hank being a self loathing domestic abuser. Following an incident in which he set his aunts upon his own wife, Steve Rogers confronted Hank Pym inside a bar against the orders of his superiors and demanded Hank change size and fight him. The resulting brawl destroys half of a city block, but ends with Steve still being able to knock Hank unconscious, showing that in this case, size definitely isn't everything. Coming in at number 9, we have Hawkeye versus the Incredible Hulk. While most battles with the Hulk turn into massive city spanning brawls, this hero versus hero encounter is more tragic than anything else. During the event known as Civil War 2, the Avengers 
Avengers receive a vision from the future that appears to show the Hulk killing most of his teammates. Given that Bruce Banner hasn't turned into the creature for at least a year by this point, the other Avengers are obviously concerned. Unfortunately, they barely have a chance to debate with Bruce before Hawkeye has shot a fatal arrow, killing Bruce instantly. And while it would later be revealed that Bruce had asked Hawkeye to do this to prevent him from hurting anyone else, and that Bruce would also eventually be resurrected by his own gamma mutation, it still was a tremendously dramatic and intense moment in an event filled with dramatic and intense moments. Coming in at number 8, we're taking a detour into the Marvel Cinematic Universe with Thor vs. Hulk from the third Thor film, Thor Ragnarok. After being stranded on the mysterious planet of Sakaar, Thor is originally overjoyed to see his friend from work, Bruce Banner. Unfortunately, the Hulk has fully embraced his new role as a Sakarian gladiator, fighting under the Grand Master, and Thor has to battle with his former ally for the amusement of the crowd. This fight scene is one of the funnest in the entire MCU, and has delighted fans ever since it was first shown off in the very first Ragnarok trailer, giving us multiple callbacks to other films and giving us a delightful new status quo for Thor and the Hulk. Coming in at number 7, we have Captain America vs. Star-Lord. Also taking place in the event Civil War 2, this superhero showdown was thankfully a lot less personal for Cap than the original Civil War event, but also featured some heroes that weren't around for the first superhero smackdown. One of the most notable of those heroes was Star-Lord, who wasn't yet a big name during Civil War 1, but had seen renewed success following the release of the Guardians of the Galaxy films, and thus was a shoe in to be featured in the sequel. Coming to Captain Marvel's aid as she stood on the pro-future vision side of the debate, Star-Lord soon found himself in fisticuffs with Captain America himself, complaining about having to fight a guy with a shield. We've all been there, Peter. We've all been there. Coming in at number 6, we have Spider-Man vs Iron Man. While these two characters have a close relationship in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and even fought on the same side during the MCU Civil War, things are a bit more complicated in the comic books. Originally siding with Iron Man, and even going so far as to reveal his identity to the public to support the Superhero Registration Act, Peter Parker eventually began to regret his actions and turned against his former friend. While Iron Man attempted to stop Spidey, with a failsafe protocol built into his iron spider suit, Peter revealed that he'd already reprogrammed it, showing that sometimes Tony Stark isn't the cleverest person in the room. Coming in at number 5, we have the Black Panther vs Wolverine. During a storyline in which the Phoenix Force, usually residing within Jean Grey, has chosen to take a new host, a tournament is fought for who should gain the honor. Two of the combatants that are given a small amount of the Phoenix Force for their bout are Wolverine and Black Panther both of whom are eager to battle one another to figure out which metal is stronger, Wolverine's adamantium skeleton or the vibranium of Wakanda. With both heroes even stronger and more violent than usual due to their phoenix possession, this fight nearly threatened to burn up the entire Marvel Universe. Coming in at number 4, we have the Hulk vs Vision. During a battle with the Hulk when Bruce Banner had lost control of the monster, the Vision attempted to use his density powers to make himself as strong and movable as the Hulk, only to find the Hulk was able to grow past his own strength. To thwart this, the Vision had to phase into the Hulk himself, trying to forge a mental connection with the Green Beast and reach Bruce Banner within. The visuals of a superhero literally phasing into another are both honestly super cool looking, but it winds up taking both the Vision's mental attacks and the pleading of Betty Ross to finally snap the Hulk out of it and return Bruce Banner's mind to the surface. Coming in at number 3, we have of Spider-Man vs Wolverine, a battle so long overdue that Spider-Man vs Wolverine is literally the name of the comic it appeared in. Following the murder of his friend Ned Leeds, Peter Parker is rescued from gangsters by Wolverine while in Europe, and forced to use a low quality Spider-Man fan costume he buys from a store. Originally working as teammates, Spider-Man and Wolverine unfortunately come to blows as Spidey realizes that Wolverine intends to kill the villains they've been fighting, and has to take on 
the bloodlust crazed mutant to prevent him from killing a woman named Charlie. Unfortunately, the woman winds up jumping in front of one of Spidey's fists herself, killing herself and traumatizing Peter in a very dark one-off that's probably best left in the 80s where it belongs. Coming in at number two, we have Captain America vs. Iron Man in the MCU film Captain America Civil War. While their fight in the comic books is an incredible spectacle all on its own, my personal favorite confrontation is how this movie deals with its final battle. Building us up with the expectation that Iron Man and Cap will have to team up to defeat an army of evil Winter Soldiers, a plot twist is thrown our way when the soldiers are revealed to be dead, and Baron Zemo reveals the reason he led the heroes out all this way was to show that Bucky Barnes killed Tony Stark's parents. Unable to accept that Cap never told him, Tony attacks Steve Rogers, and the two have a climactic battle that their friendship never really recovered from until the events of Avengers Endgame. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have Thor vs. Iron Man, following the events of the Civil War comic book series. Tony Stark has made a lot of iffy choices in the comics, but few have been as disastrous as his attempt at a Thor clone. Intended to be a powerful deterrent against Cap's team during Civil War, this clone called Ragnarok quickly went out of control and caused the deaths of several heroes. Whenever the true Thor returned, he was furious at what Tony had done with his genetic code and fried every system in the suit of Iron Man armor, leaving Tony to walk back to Avengers HQ humiliated and defeated with one of the most decisive superhero smackdowns in comic book history.